off we go. So, uh, Ted, uh, Riley is going to take the lead on this because okay. he's the one who's got the best mastery of the facts. Okay. Well, first of all, Dr. Tenno, thank you so much for joining us. It's really an honor and a privilege to speak with you today. It's an honor uh, and a privilege for me. <laughs> And um, I think maybe the best way to start off just for our viewers and for um, is just if you can just give us a quick bio, your medical background, how you basically came to make these like viral videos on YouTube, essentially. Uh, you know, sometimes life takes you where you never expected to go. Uh, I started, well, I went to medical school at Loma Linda University, which people may remember from the story of Baby Faye, the baboon heart transplant. I know all the people who were involved in that. I uh, graduated there in 1976. I continued on in training in anesthesiology and critical care medicine and finished that in 1980. That was also at Loma Linda University. And I moved to Florida, where I never intended to go, in 1980. Uh, I practiced at Florida Hospital and other associated facilities until I retired on New Year's Day of 19, or excuse me, of 2013. Along that way, I spent some time doing critical care medicine. I spent some time doing pain medicine, and uh, also served as the medical director, which is a, an administrative position with uh, what now is known as Downtown Surgery Center, which is owned by Nova Med Medical, and there were that was from 01 to 10. In any case. I got a call from my brother in 2013 after the very famous what difference does it make anyway event. What difference at this point does it make? And he said she's right. got Parkinson's disease. I'm going, what are you talking about? And he says that's a Parkinson's rage. What difference at this point does it make? And he has continued to pound on that. Since that time, I've become very uh, well acquainted with a gentleman in upstate New York who has advanced Parkinson's. And so we spend quite a bit of time on online. And I've since learned about a lot of other caregivers and uh, Parkinson's family members. And basically, these are the people who are saying, look, Hillary has got these signs. She has her big, wide open eyes at times. She has her pauses which they call freezes, and I, so I started studying. And I never really intended to do anything, among other things, because I couldn't figure out how to tell the story. And then when I saw the InfoWars report of uh, Secret Service coming to uh, Joe Biggs, I said, okay, now I have a way I can tell the story that makes sense. And so I just simply used that as a way to tell the story, put together the story, and uh, the rest is history. Really interesting, but so a lot of your critics who have seen your videos um, say that you know you're not a specialist in neurological disorders. You're not a specialist in Parkinson's. That's true. So, so how would how would you respond to that criticism? It's absolutely true, yeah. and I'm not making a firm diagnosis. What I'm doing is saying, look, I've been pointed to these things, and I start with a foundation of knowledge that all physicians have, and I've taken the time to spend, I mean, to bury myself in the literature in the support groups, in all of the other things around Parkinson's disease, talking with people, so that I think I have a fairly good understanding of how Parkinson's impacts people and how the various treating physicians are going to manage it. Mm -hmm. right. um, I, Riley, I want to stay on this credibility question uh, because I think it's actually it's central, it's really key. Um, so uh, yesterday, Ted, you were talking about um, the fact, I, I thought there were two interesting things you brought up that spoke to your credibility. Um, you spoke about your own experience as an anesthesiologist and uh, the necessity of you mm -hmm. being conversant in an awful lot of um, very okay. many different modalities mm -hmm. of caring mm -hmm. for people. But you also, I thought it was important that you, uh, that you are retired and that you have the time to dig into this because most people are really, really, really busy with what they do every day, and they don't 
they can't do this. And so, you know, if you've got a, a, a trained and sort of a competent and accomplished medical doctor who can spend hours and hours digging into this, that's actually a significant fact. And I think it speaks to credibility that you actually have the time, to, you know, mm-hmm. you've been able to put the time in to really do the research and study the literature and understand things, mm-hmm. you know, and that, so those two things I would. Well, let's, let's start with the, the first point on yeah. having uh, what I had to do in the operating room. I was the internist in the operating room. I had to be conversant in every uh, medical disease that would come to me. And if something, some rare bird showed up, I had to be able within a period of four or five minutes to become sufficiently conversant to be able to properly treat the patient. Okay. Mm-hmm. Which means in a sense, I'm the cardiologist, pulmonologist, nephrologist, hepatologist. I'm all of those things into one. I'm just not as specialized as they are. So I have a better foundation than almost anybody else to come to this. Mm -hmm. As far as the time, absolutely, time is a big issue. And the interview I did with Sean Hannity uh, opposite um, Zudi Jasser, I think, is illustrative. Because Dr. Jasser is a wonderful internist. He's a great guy and he had great points. But he had not had the time to do a frame-by-frame analysis of the episode where Hillary's getting into the Scooby van. Mm -hmm. And actually, people had pointed me to a couple things there. And so I went back frame-by-frame. And I was able to see that she didn't collapse at all. She was in a wooden posture. And when she tipped, she stayed in that wooden posture where her head stayed absolutely the same in relation to her body. Right. And that is a very different issue than collapsing. And right. he had not had the time to see that. Going we back are to the, I think one of the articles that uh, people you know, look in, at uh, when they see your video and are and so uh, skeptical that they read that that Snopes debunking, right? And and <laughs> and a lot about half of it is basically what you could basically call character assassination. So right. they say, you know, you're not a parking specialist and you don't like Hillary Clinton, so that dismisses all of your points, whether they're valid or not. Like, how would you respond to that? Do you think that your own political leanings has tainted your ability to look at this objectively? Well, if if one takes a look at my video on how to prove me wrong, they'll see that my political leanings don't play into the issue. Uh, what I did say very clearly up front is say, I find Hillary Clinton to be morally and politically unacceptable. That is saying, I'm telling you what my bias is. And every one of us has a bias. There's just no way around it. We all have biases. And if I look at uh, ABC, for example, you've got David Muir, who's very telegenic up there. My wife likes to watch him. But when you watch their reporting, it's very clearly slanted. They pay no attention to anything that would ever cast a bad light on Hillary Clinton. Do they admit their bias? No, they won't do it. I'm saying, look, here I am. I'm out for everybody to see. Here's my bias. Now, medically, here's where I go. And in the video I did on how to prove me wrong, I said there are two ways to prove me wrong. The first one is... Look at any one of the specific things I pointed out and show me how Parkinson's disease either does not fit or something else fits better. And two, how about we release real records, and as I said on Hannity's show, records that explain what we see. We can't be in the position of a lady in uh, duck soup listening to Chico Marx say, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? Just sort of shifting gears, we would like to talk a little bit about the latest medical records that Clinton (laughs) released, if we can call them that, by her doctor, Lisa Bardak. And uh, You mean these? Yeah, right. (laughs) So if you could, just for, um, in layman's term, maybe highlight reasons that you think that this is not a very credible document or any issues that you might have with it, if you can explain it to us. Well, I have to thank a Dr. Wolf who po- who tweets for a couple of points. Uh, let's look here. He t- she releases a non-contrast chest CT scan, including a CTA calcium score. Oh, wait a minute. CTA is uh, computed tomography and geography. That is a contrast study. 
She says a non-contrast chest CT scan. It says total non sequitur. Right. Somebody's putting words out to make them look good. Um, it says she has a small right middle lobe pneumonia. Let's suppose she has it. It's possible. It happens that the right middle lobe, because of the anatomy of the bronchi, is the most common place to get an aspiration pneumonia, which could come from her Parkinson's. Okay, and please excuse me here. I just spoke in the declarative mood, and that was a problem where people were looking at my big video because I slipped from the, the subjunctive, that is the mood of possibility or probability, mm -hmm. into the declarative mood from time to time for the ease of presentation. This is all subjunctive. It is the realm of probability. I, it's I not the realm of certainty. It's right. hypothesis. It is not the realm of certainty. Right. I want to make that clear because people have tried to take it the other direction. Okay. Um, as I read down on the second page toward the bottom of the large paragraph, her thyroid blood tests are normal. Of note, she has remained stable for many years on armor thyroid to treat her hypothyroidism, parentheses, a low T3 level, close parentheses. I'm sorry, that's archaic. Armor thyroid, yeah, you can use it. It's out there. It's legitimate. And if somebody's been stable on it, fine, no big deal. You don't change meds to change meds. But when we look at it, hypothyroidism, a low T3 level, no. Uh, endocrinologists, when I was in medical school, were using what's called T4. That's the thyroid hormone with four iodines on it as the level of uh, your thyroid function. Well, it turns out the body has to convert it to thyroid hormone with three iodines, that's T3, and that's what actually works at the cellular level. So they went to measuring T3. Well, they discovered that wasn't quite useful because it's such a short half-life and varied with a bunch of things. And so they tried to come up with some way of putting it together. They went to what's called a resin T3 index, which has been since been supplanted by TSH. And basically what that is, it's thyroid stimulating hormone. And it says when your thyroid function goes down, your pituitary gland says, no, it's got to come back out and pushes out. TSH to tell the thyroid, put out more thyroid. And TSH is the standard of care. So we've got someone here using an archaic method of monitoring. But let's go further. Blood pressure of 100 over 70, heart rate of 70. Well, that sounds really, really good. If you were an athlete, that would be fine. The standard for women of her age is a blood pressure above 130. Uh, here's another place where I have an advantage. One of my close golfing buddies is chief of cardiology, or was chief of cardiology at Florida Hospital where I practiced. That's where I met him. And he talks about the, at her age, you don't want blood pressure that low. So you sit here and you say 100 over 70, that's really low. Heart rate is 70, women heart, women's heart rate is typically 80. And so while this is not proof of anything, please, again, we're in the realm of probabilities. This is something that might happen if you had Parkinson's disease because there is what we call an autonomic dysfunction. The autonomics are the system, the nervous system that controls all the automatic parts of your body, your sweating, your blood pressure, your heart rate, and so on. That's all autonomic function. And so this just... It's just one more piece that says, hmm. But then comes the one that just jumped out at me. Pulse oximetry of 99%. Pulse oximetry came into clinical practice in 1986. I have used it every day on virtually every patient I treated since then. So I think I know what I'm talking about here. First, a pulse oximetry level of 99% would be expected in a normal person up possibly through the age of 35 or 40. Beyond that, a normal person with no illness whatever will see their oxygen saturation drop by 1 to 2% per decade. So at age 70 for round numbers, the highest number we should see for her totally healthy, no pneumonia, no nothing is 97. I'm sorry, 99 is not plausible. And 
when she has a pneumonia, it's going to take a week or two to get full recovery. So she should be 95, 96. Now, anything above 94, you can walk around and be okay as long as you're not exerting yourself. So, you know, it's not a big deal. But this just puts the lie to the validity of this report. That's really interesting. Tell me, doctor, um, that that high uh, oxygen saturation number, um, Would you are you suggesting that uh, that was an oversight somehow that they um, that this report has no basis in fact or reality and that because obviously if they're trying to if they were making up a medical report and they were putting out numbers they wouldn't deliberately put out a number that's totally unrealistic I mean it suggests that this was like a, a mistake upon somebody's part is that what you're suggesting well, the benign explanation is that it's a mistake or the machine was malfunctioning. That's the benign explanation. The more what, is it possible that a that a that a Dr. Bardak would not have noticed this mistake uh, because she's not as conversant in them in these numbers as you are, who's seen seen it much more than she has. I tell you what happens with a general practitioner or internist when you go into their office. The nurse does all of the intake stuff, blood pressure, puts you on the scales, heart rate, and puts an oximeter on your finger and writes down a number. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so this is not something that's particularly likely that she would be closely uh, conversant with. I mean, she could be, but it's not likely. And so I, because of all of the other times when we have had stuff come out that says she's perfectly healthy and then we have these various episodes that aren't answered it takes us all toward the less benign answer okay all right we're seeing more and more actually doctors like yourself or medical experts coming forward and offering their opinion or their take uh you know i don't think as many are as uh, invested in this as you are but we're seeing more of it but I wanted to ask you briefly, why why don't we see more Ted Noels making these really compelling videos on YouTube? What what um, what do you think is keeping doctors from weighing in on uh, this really important topic, which is you know the health of our potentially future leader? Two reasons. One is time. You know, it takes time to sit down and prepare this. It took me over four hours just to get the script for that video correct right and even then it's obvious that I made some mistakes by not getting the mood of what I said correct you know the the verbal mood uh, the second thing is that the IRS is a piker compared to CMS you're gonna have to explain CMS? what CMS yeah. is for CMS well I I knew them by the, the acronym CMMS which was the Center for Medi uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services they're the people who pay doctors for Medicare and Medicaid work. Uh -huh. And they have, within law and regulation, the ability to walk into your practice unannounced, do an audit, and the moment they find something that's slightly less than perfect, charge you with Medicare fraud, and you have the potential to lose years of income. All right. Because they get multiple repayment. It's not a pretty story. Let me tell you, there is no physician who can withstand an audit where they want to find something. There is a psychiatrist in prison right now because he undercharged Medicare. Mm -hmm. Undercharged, okay. and he's in prison for Medicare fraud. Okay, um, this is just a, a repeat of the question I asked yesterday. Well, wouldn't people be, uh, well, there's two answers to that. Uh, one is people who are more than three years retired, as you are, so they're not in danger mm -hmm. of losing their income stream. Secondly, um, what about, you know, I mean, if a doctor came out and, and criticized Hillary Clinton uh, and then was investigated by this CMS group, um, it would be such a red flag he'd become a hero of the you know alternative media and the libertarians and the pro-trump people so they wouldn't dare and touch him um, the, i don't find that a, comp a compelling argument at this point the second one 
I don't find that a compelling argument right now. Dr. Drew Pinsky simply raised the question about how well treated Hillary was on thyroid medicines. Mm -hmm. And he lost his, ra his TV show and no explanation, you're out. Give me a break, that's trivial. And it's a fairly substantial loss right there. Is he considered a uh, hero to some degree, but he still has a big financial loss? All right. So you're saying that there's big, mm, there's a lot at stake for our doctors who come forward. Huge, there. huge amount at stake. What about the first uh, uh, excuse? What about retired doctors who aren't in danger of having their practice uh, affected? Uh, it depends on how interested you are in the subject. It really does. And do you have the preparation to be able to go after it? And do you have the, int you know, it, it's an issue of, okay, do I really want to do this? Or do I want to play golf? Do I want to do other things to my friends? Do I want to travel? Do I want to do these other things? And you look at it and say, which is more important? Let's, let's sort of look to the future now. So, assuming that Hillary Clinton has some very serious health condition, very possibly mm -hmm. Parkinson's, what should, we, what should we be expecting, what should we be looking for in the, in the coming days and weeks? Because, to be honest, you know, she made some, uh, two, two appearances yesterday, and she, she didn't look half bad, I have to say. No, so she looked good. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, see, here's, here's the thing, and that's why I put out my field guide to spotting her symptoms. Right. Uh, Parkinson's disease is an up and down, up and down kind of a thing. You get your levodopa levels up, you do well, you function well. If you get them too high, you start getting these oddball dyskinesias. So it, you're treading a fine line between enough and too much, but assuming that you're up, you can move more freely. Hey, the movement disorder specialist did his job. I can move freely, I can speak freely, I don't have these other big problems. But in spite of that, you're going to see from time to time a freeze. One of the things I find sort of fascinating about this whole debate is, um, you know, Hillary Clinton doesn't have exactly the best track record when it comes to transparency and telling the truth. But this is this seems like a, if she's lying about this, this seems like something that she won't be able to hide forever. Eventually, something's going to come out. Like that's sort of the feeling that I get. So I, as just as a doctor, my, I'm really curious about what your opinion is. I mean, will she? Assuming she does have a medical condition, do you think she'd be able to hide it from the American public right up to the election, or do you think it won't? It'll she be might. She might be able to. Uh, you can argue that what she's trying to do is run out the clock. Right. And with careful stage managing, with careful management of her meds. Again, I'm in the declarative mode here. Uh, if you do things right you can reduce the chance of showing any of these bad events. There's one place you're going to have real trouble doing that, and that's at a debate. Right. And if she has to stand for an hour and a half or two hours, that's going to be a load that will tend to show what's out there. And almost certainly the Donald will come up with some sort of a stressful comment. And those are the things that tend to trigger events. So when we get done with all of that, uh, we have a real probability that something will show, but it is not a certainty. And so when we look at all of this, we're sitting here going, okay, what is the upshot of this? The uncertainty over her health doesn't go away. It continues to weigh on her candidacy. And so she gets more and more pressure to be out in front and look healthy to try to dispel the uncertainty. I can't, I, you know, I don't have a crystal ball to say what happens, but my, my impression is the longer she waits, the more the drumbeat just keeps going, the drip, drip, drip just keeps going, and just like the emails, they wouldn't go away this is probably not going to go away and ultimately it's going to be very difficult for her to maintain a winning vote well I, I imagine that if she has another episode like she did on September 11th <clears> that's <throat> that's that's it right 
So I I would say that if she has an episode at the debate, there's going to be no way to cover it. Yeah. And well, then you have yeah. then the political calculation is okay. The Democratic National Committee has to come up with oh she hid all of this from us, and so now we've got to uh, put somebody in. And who do they put? They put Joe Biden. Do they elevate Kane? Do they find a third person? You know, uh, Elizabeth Warren. Uh, I don't, you know, it becomes a real problem for them. Yeah, I don't know if you saw it, but she fielded a few, you know, uh, softballs after her speech in, in Greensboro, North Carolina. And she was asked about when Tim Kane was, was told about her pneumonia, and she wouldn't give a straight answer. She deflected all questions about, even basic questions, like, when did your running mate know that you had pneumonia? She wouldn't even answer it, you know? So it's, oh, see, that, that just makes it worse. That looks yeah. like cover-up. And again, that's political, that's not medical, but uh, that looks cover-up all the way. Yeah, what I really like about your analysis, Dr. Noel, is that I think that if you look at some of the odd behavior, whatever you want to call it, from Hillary over the last six months, year, decade, mm -hmm. you can just chalk it up to, well, you know, sometimes people are, you know, do odd things. But when you really put it all together, it really makes a very convincing case. And the one thing from your most recent video that <coughs> really struck me as it's beyond coincidence is are those blue glasses, the blue sunglasses. <laughs> yes. Who wears, who wears, and those aren't just like tinted, those are like blue, they're blue, blue sunglasses. And can you explain why why would someone wear blue sunglasses? <laughs> Hang on, let me look on my desk here for a minute. I've got it in the notes. Ah, fiddle. Um, those blue guy sunglasses were identified on Parkinson's disease forums as Zeiss Z1 F155, I think is the, the tint, sunglasses. They happen not to be sold in the U.S. Wow. <laughs> and there is... And you, you saw on that video a piece of an incredible video of a man, I believe he actually had dyskinesia tardive, which is one of the major movement disorders, where he's sitting with these horrendous, I mean, his head is just rapidly doing this thing, and he manages to reach down, get a pair of blue sunglasses, he puts them on, and all of a sudden he's able to sit still. Right. He's able to walk without these major disorders. And these blue sunglasses have been shown to reduce these major movement disorders in a whole raft of them and also to reduce certain seizure, photosensitive seizure disorders. And so you look at that and you say, okay, that's interesting. Now you look at the crowd. Who's got sunglasses? Can I yeah. spell nobody? Or who's dehydrated, I mean, right? <laughs> well, well, we, well, that's a separate question. We can get to that. But I mean, there are a couple of bikers over on one side who are kind of on the outside who are wearing brown sunglasses, but when you look, the handful of people with sunglasses on this overcast day are all wearing brown or gray. Right. She's wearing bright blue. She's the only one with bright blue. That just waves a big flag. And we saw this once before on Memorial Day at Chappaqua when she attended a, a celebration. She wore blue sunglasses, the same ones. <laughs> Oh, okay, wait. Let's really? talk about this sunglasses thing for a second here, just because I'm somebody. I'm a good, perhaps, example of 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 uh, 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 um, somebody who might be watching this. Who, whatever. Here's the thing. I don't. I never wear sunglasses, and I don't pay attention much to what kind of sunglasses people wear. Um, is it really uncommon to wear blue sunglasses, or do some people actually wear them just for fashion purposes? Why, why would you wear oh. blue sunglasses at a 9-11 memorial? It seems like something you'd wear at, like, a, I don't even know, you know, a Woodstock, like, you know, convention or something. Well, it's first of all, on, on, a, on an overcast day, why are you wearing sunglasses at all? I mean, 9-11 memorial, blue sunglasses, yeah, would be bad taste. Yes, there are other blue sunglasses out there, but this one particular appears to have been shown to be most effective in handling those movement disorders. Because I guess my question is this, mm -hmm. if, um, if blue sunglasses are such an odd thing to wear and sort of a recognized uh, sign that they might be being used for a medical condition, then you have to wonder, well, why does she wear them to public events? Right and um, why? Why doesn't I mean, she put us? You, you think she'd only put them on if? Well, yeah, they might not be that common, but some people do wear them, and it's not a sign of anything sort of out of the ordinary. 
Is that, I'm and just why, wouldn't, that. why wouldn't her team take the same film that you tint the windows on your car and put a tint across the front of them so that they wouldn't stand out like a neon light? Yeah, cause I don't know if you've seen the pictures, Charles, but they are like bright blue. We're not talking about sort of dark sunglasses. I might have sort of yeah, you know, see, a, navy, these a navy blue. I mean, these are... Very They're clear, like searchlights. Like, yeah, they really are. It's it's <laughs> and I really no. It, honestly, they look like something that John Lennon would wear. You know, like on some interview with you know on the, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's really bizarre. And and but I guess I guess a follow up question though is that so you are acknowledging though, Doctor Duell, that this the, uh, that assuming these sunglasses are for medical purposes, it couldn't just it's not just for Parkinson's. It could be any sort of motor motor disorder. Well, there's a whole family of major movement disorders that are uh -huh. called Parkinson Plus, and you've got dyskinesia tardive, Shy Drager syndrome, um, you know, and on and on. I have a, on one of my notepads, there's a list of about 10 of these. Uh, uh, you can even have movement disorders from multiple sclerosis or mad cow disease. Wow. So, you know, this is what we call a differential diagnosis. There's a whole basket of these things that are possible, but they all are tightly related in how they manifest. And they all have very awful outlook for the sufferer. Yeah, and Charles, you know, getting back to sort of your point, and I understand where you're coming from, you know, I think someone who's skeptical of this theory could say, come on, guys, you're like talking about blue sunglasses. But, you know, the sort of bizarre nature of a blue sunglass, you combine that with this wealth of video evidence of this totally bizarre behavior and you can't help mm -hmm. but you know you know connecting a few dots you know it just seems I agree I agree so it's, strange it's I just wasn't aware so of how you know out of the ordinary blue sunglasses are I never go into the sunglasses stores I don't know <laughs> what people are wearing I know like these different trends come along I see sometimes mm -hmm. people walking around with orange looking lenses or something in their sunglasses so I don't know you know maybe it's the well, some, a, a color wear, some people choose for fashion reasons I, don't know. I wear amber sunglasses on the golf course to enhance contrast right yeah. I mean I just okay. don't consider Hillary Clinton a hipster so it's like why is she wearing <laughs> you, why is she wearing these you know totally far out psychedelic sunglasses I don't know we never talked about dehydration and let me hit yes that yeah let's do that, let's do that. <clears throat> dehydration comes from two possibilities one you don't drink two you lose fluids that's it no alternatives as an anesthesiologist and critical care medicines guy, those were my daily stock in trade. So I speak with firm authority here. She arrived at the event hydrated. Therefore, in order for her to become dehydrated, she either had to sweat like a pig, which I do on the golf course, hydrate or die. There's no imagery that shows a drop of sweat on her that I know about. She had to bleed, she had to have diarrhea, she had to vomit, or have taken some medicine and gave her a massive diuresis, where that is peeing. There's no evidence of any of those things happening. Therefore, categorically, she was not dehydrated. Really interesting. Well, definitely keep us posted on everything that you do, and we, of course, we're very eager to share your thoughts with our readers. And Well, you're most welcome. I, uh, I've enjoyed being with you. As the medical director, which is a, an administrative position with uh, what now is known as Downtown Surgery Center, which is owned by Nova Med Medical, and there were, that was from 01 to 10. In any case, I got a call from my brother in 2013 after the very famous What Difference Does It Make Anyway event. What difference at this point does it make? And he said, she's right. got Parkinson's disease. I'm going, what are you talking about? And he says, that's a Parkinson's rage. What difference at this point does it make? And... He has continued to pound on that. Since that time, I've become very uh, well acquainted with a gentleman in upstate New York who has advanced Parkinson's. And so we spend quite a bit of time on online. And I've since learned about a lot of other caregivers and uh, Parkinson's family members. And basically, these are the people who are saying, look, Hillary has got these signs. She has her big, wide open eyes at times. She has her pauses 
which they called freezes, and I, so I started studying. And I never really intended to do anything, among other things, because I couldn't figure out how to tell the story. And then when I saw the InfoWars report of uh, Secret Service coming to uh, Joe Biggs, I said, okay, now I have a way I can tell the story that makes sense. And so I just simply used that as a way to tell the story, put together the story. Off we go. So, uh, Ted, uh, Riley is going to take the lead on this because okay. he's the one who's got the best mastery of the facts. Okay. Well, first of all, Dr. Tenno, thank you so much for joining us. It's really an honor and a privilege to speak with you today. It's an honor and a privilege for me. <laughs> and um, I think maybe the best way to start off just for our viewers and for um, is just if you can just give us a quick bio, your medical background, how you basically came to make these like viral videos on YouTube, essentially. Uh, you know, sometimes life takes you where you never expected to go. Uh, I started, well, I went to medical school at Loma Linda University, which people may remember from the story of Baby Faye, the baboon heart transplant. I know all the people who were involved in that. I uh, graduated there in 1976. I continued on in training in anesthesiology and critical care medicine and finished that in 1980. That was also at Loma Linda University. And I moved to Florida, where I never intended to go, in 1980. Uh, I practiced at Florida Hospital and other associated facilities until I retired on New Year's Day of 19, or excuse me, of 2013. Along that way, I spent some time doing critical care medicine. I spent some time doing pain medicine, and uh, also served. At, and I was able to see that she didn't collapse at all. She was in a wooden posture, and when she tipped she stayed in that wooden posture where her head stayed absolutely the same in relation to her body. Right. And that is a very different issue than collapsing. And right. he had not had the time to see that. Going we back are trading to the, I think partners, one of the articles that people uh, you know, look in, at uh, when they see currency video and are options and uh, so on. skeptical that they read that, that Snopes debunking, right? And, and, <laughs> and a lot, about half of it is basically what you could basically call character assassination. So right. they say, you know, you're not a parking specialist and you don't like Hillary Clinton. So that dismisses all of your points, whether they're valid or not. Like, how would you respond to that? Do you think that your own political leanings has tainted your ability to look at this objectively? Well, if, if one takes a look at my video on how to prove me wrong, they'll see that my political leanings don't play into the issue. Uh, what I did say very clearly up front is say, I find Hillary Clinton to be morally and politically unacceptable. That is saying, I'm telling you what my bias is. And every one of us has a bias. There's just no way around it. We all have biases. And if I look at uh, ABC, for example, you've got David Muir, who's very telegenic up there. My wife likes to watch him. But when you watch their reporting, it's very clearly slanted. They pay, and they don't, they can't do this. And so, you know, if you've got a a, a trained and sort of a competent and accomplished medical doctor who can spend hours and hours digging into this, that's actually a significant fact. And I think it speaks to credibility that you actually have the time, to, you know, mm -hmm. you've been able to put the time in to really do the research and study the literature and understand things, mm -hmm. you know, and that. So those two things, I would. Well, let's let's start with the the first point, on yeah. having uh, what I had to do in the operating room. I was the internist in the operating room. I had to be conversant in every uh, medical disease that would come to me, and if something some rare bird showed up, I had to be able within a period of four or five minutes to become sufficiently conversant to be able to properly treat the patient. Okay, mm -hmm. which means in a sense I'm the cardiologist, pulmonologist, nephrologist hepatologist, I'm all of those things into one. I'm just not as specialized as they are. So right. I have a better foundation than almost anybody else to come to this. Mm -hmm. As far as the time, absolutely, time is a big issue. And the interview I did with Sean Hannity uh, opposite um, Zudi Jasser, I think is illustrative. 
because Dr. Jasser is a wonderful internist. He's a great guy and he had great points, but he had not had the time to do a frame by frame analysis of the episode where Hillary's getting into the Scooby van. Mm -hmm. And actually, people had pointed me to a couple things there, and so I went back frame by frame, and uh, the rest is history. It's really interesting. But so a lot of your critics who have seen your videos um, say that, you know, you're not a specialist in neurological disorders. You're not a specialist in Parkinson's. That's true. So, so how, would, how would you respond to that criticism? It's absolutely true. Yeah. And I'm not making a firm diagnosis. What I'm doing is saying, look, I've been pointed to these things. And I start with a foundation of knowledge that all physicians have. And I've taken the time to spend, I mean, to bury myself in the literature in the support groups, in all of the other things around Parkinson's disease, talking with people, so that I think I have a fairly good understanding of how Parkinson's impacts people and how the various treating physicians are going to manage it. Mm -hmm. right. um, I, Riley, I want to stay on this credibility question uh, because I think it's actually it's central, it's really key. Um, so uh, yesterday, Ted, you were talking about um, the fact, I, I thought there were two interesting things you brought up that spoke to your credibility. Um, you spoke about your own experience as an anesthesiologist and uh, the necessity of you mm -hmm. being conversant in an awful lot of um, very okay. many different modalities mm -hmm. of caring mm -hmm. for people. But you also, I thought it was important that you, uh, that you are retired and that you have the time to dig into this because most people are really, really, really busy with what they do every day. 